Bearmac Land Rover Parts are proud sponsors of Land Rovers Live, bringing you all the best parts of the 4x4 world. Hi and welcome to this week's episode of Land Rovers Live. As always, I'm Matt and coming up on this week's show we bring you all the latest 4x4 news as well as that. We meet the owner of that special Series 1 prototype that we saw a few weeks ago to see what else he's got up his sleeve. And later on we'll be bringing you highlights from one of my favourite seminars from the Adventure Overland show just a couple of weeks ago in Stratford. But first, the news. Unless you've been living under a rock, you will know that there is a new James Bond film in production at the moment and Land Rover have been providing them with some interesting looking vehicles. Now recently Land Rover have well, taken some time out of their busy production schedule of getting cars that are ready to be smashed to bits to put a little video together to well, show you a bit of interesting stuff behind the scenes and uh, well let's take a look. Our everyday activity is vehicle customization, tailoring for the customer's needs. It just so happened that the customer this time was the new James Bond movie. Eon knew about the Defenders because obviously we'd used them in Skyfall and they were aware about the Range Rover Sport. What they weren't aware of was the Range Rover Sport SVR. They wanted us to be creative um, and do what we do best so we provided them with a number of concepts. Once we knew we were going to be involved with the programme, we met up with Gary Powell and his stunt team, who are obviously the people who are going to be using these cars on set. And it was great to get involved with those guys and understand what their needs were very early in the programme in order for us to be able to deliver what they wanted. The SVR is an incredibly capable car with an awful lot of power. So we were quite surprised to get a request from, from Gary and the team for even more power. And then when we saw this incredible chase scene in the Alps, we really couldn't wait to build something that was just going to be so exciting to do. We fitted roll cages into the cars for safety, we fitted new fuel cells. To be able to then take it and surprise even more people by putting lights, big tyres, everything black, it just had so much more presence than, than anything we'd ever dreamt of. It's great. You know, we've got a high performance, full capability, both in the Defender and in the Range Rover Sport SVR. There's no lack of confidence there, we knew it was the right product for the right job. Being part of this whole film is incredibly exciting and it's, it's something that's so addictive to be involved with. You can't help yourself, you know, we're all kids at heart. We love seeing that sort of thing and to be able to build the cars that are going to go and do that is an incredible challenge and a really cool thing to do. We've had a great time working with the Bond team. It's so exciting, you know, to, to know that your car or those products are going to be in one of the biggest franchise movies in the world. Right now we are filming our Austrian action sequence. Helicopter and seven cameras, they are static on the ground. And that's more or less what it's like on Land Rovers Live on a weekly basis. But uh, anyway, moving on. The other thing that they've been doing which is quite interesting recently is, well I don't know if you recall, but there was an announcement of an Evoke convertible. This made a few eyebrows raised, including mine, and now they've gone a bit further to prove that it's a reasonable vehicle. So what Land Rover have done is tried to take the pedigree and testing that they've put into all the other previous vehicles and show that it still applies to the Evoque. We'll see that it's, well, pretty capable. It's at the weighting depth of 500 mil, which is more or less the same across the board. They've done all sorts of things which I imagine you would have to do to make a, a car without a roof work. Um, they probably picked that up from the Series 1 along the way. And in this bit of video here, they show that it's more than capable off-road and it has all of the things that you'd expect from a Land Rover. Hill descent control, the different modes for all the different surfaces and it wades and all sorts of pretty stuff. Still no word on when that will be available, but when it is, we will let you know and we'll see if we can borrow one and see what it's all about. That said, it'll probably be just in time for the snow. Land Rover. Meet the newest member of the Land Rover family, the Range Rover Evoque Convertible. Taking the already strong and dynamic Evoque body shell, we were able to make a vehicle that could easily cover all terrains. Obviously, taking the roof off any car affects the rigidity. Using the Evoque body shell, we were able to retain this rigidity 
through modifications invisible to the customer and invisible to the driver to enjoy a good dynamic drive on and off road. The terrain response system means we can deliver a car calibrated to ensure a fun and engaging dynamic driving style on a variety of surfaces. So even on gravel surfaces, dirt roads, snow and ice, this will be a fun car to drive. The Evoke convertible can weigh to half a metre deep, so we've not compromised any of its weighting capability over a standard vehicle. Systems like weight sensing mean the driver has the confidence in the depth that car is driving through. We knew we would be able to create a convertible that would wear the Land Rover badge with pride. After all, all-terrain open-air motoring is in our DNA. Like every Land Rover before it, the Evoke convertible's immense capability matches its spirit of adventure, allowing you to experience the great outdoors like never before. Now, the keen-eyed viewers amongst you will remember when we sent Ben Gribbin along from Fun Rover to interview a chap who had got a Series 1 pre-production model. It was a beautiful vehicle, and he had some other things, including this Minerva. Uh, Nigel also owns a Minerva, which is a, a, a particularly rare Land Rover. Essentially, mechanically, it's a Rover-built product, but uh, built under licence by Minerva, so they um, had uh, CKD kits, which are knockdown kits from Land Rover initially, um, to provide the mechanicals. They then produced their own body um, and built them in reasonably large numbers, mainly for the military. Mm. Um, I say they were used by the military, well, as far as I know, right up until the 80s. Wow. Um, and then some were put in reserve, but most were sold off. Okay. I don't know what they replaced it with, but um, anyway. You can't replace something that's a Land Rover. Well, no. <laughs> I've spoken to several people from Belgium who used to drive them, and they remembered them well, mm. and uh, they you know, used them, and that was it. So, um, anyway, a lot fell into civilian hands, and yeah. were used and abused and a few uh, have remained in untouched condition and uh, they are now being more appreciated and um, people are bringing them over to England because the price of civilians English series ones mm. has risen dramatically um, and these represent good value and, and in good condition because most of them have quite low mileage so it costs quite a bit to restore um, a particularly uh, sort of um, poor condition English Land Rover, mm. whereas one of these, which is running and low mileage, really, cosmetically you've just got to uh, wake it up, if you like, mm. and, um, and get it running and use it, um, as opposed to a total rebuild, which is quite an expensive occupation. Yeah, absolutely. So visually, it does look different to a Series 1. Yes. Is that from the steel that they've used uh, in the body? Not so much the steel, the, the, the fittings that the military wanted. So mm. in other words, the spare wheel carrier on the back, um, front wings are completely different. Um, bonnet, doors, rear tub, um, those sort of things are very similar to um, the English equivalent. Chassis uh, was Minerva's own chassis eventually, okay. but Initially, they used the Rover chassis. What sort of time frame is this vehicle from? Uh, this one's 52, 1952. Okay. Well, this one needs, as I say, waking up. I think it's been in store. Uh, it runs, um, but uh, I did have one two years ago, and somebody bought it. Basically, he did a service. He just checked the brakes over, mm. changed the hoses, and away he went. Um, and I've met him since, and he, he said it's absolutely lovely. He likes the fact it's unrestored, yeah. original. He's left it as it is, and I think this vehicle is the same, really. Yeah. It just wants, uh, it's got a lot tires. of character. Yeah, it's got a lot of character. It wants new tyres, it just wants a service, change the oils, and uh, use it. Brilliant. You know, it's, been, it's been unused for mm. a long time. Sometimes you don't need to restore no, a vehicle, I think, do you? Uh, and I think more and more people are finding that if you've got an original Series mm. 1 that has the original paintwork, however faded, uh, and worn, actually, people are more interested in that sort of thing. It's nice to see a really well yeah. restored Series 1, but it's also nice to see one that's mm. untouched. Absolutely. If you can find one, you know, they are it's a, a rare. It's hen's teeth nowadays. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Nigel. Okay.
And don't forget, we would like to hear from you. If you've got an interesting vehicle or you're doing something interesting with the vehicle, do get in touch with us. We'll put some links on the screen, but you can get in touch with us on Facebook and or Twitter and possibly our website as well. So please do that. We love to hear from you. And we're always after people for the Land Rovers Live Owners Club and whatever else interesting that you're doing as well. As well as that, the coming up after the break, we will have one of the highlights of the Adventure Overland Show. Incidentally, we've put all of those videos on our website and on YouTube and wherever else online we live. So do come back after the break for that and we'll see you on the other side. Bearmac Land Rover Parts are proud sponsors of Land Rovers Live, bringing you all the best parts of the 4x4 world. Welcome back to Land Rovers Live. Before the break, we caught up on a bit of news and had a look at some Minerva. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were at our final big show of the season, which was the Adventure Overland Show in Stratford. And if you weren't there, you missed out on a whole bunch of great seminars. But worry not, we have put them all up online for you. And if they're not there now, they will be there very shortly. Um, there were about 20 odd seminars, ranging with tips ranging from how to keep your vehicle afloat, how to prepare for any overland trips, whether it be kits, your personal preparation, bribing police officers, etc, etc. Even if you're not planning an overland trip, these seminars are really great. They show some good common sense advice and what have you, so I do recommend you to check those out. But now is the highlights of one of my favourite ones. Why am I standing up here talking about safety and security? Just sort of as a way of introduction, for those of you who don't know anything about me, so 30 years in the industry of international security, 34 years of overland travel, I guess, off and on. Some of the countries I've visited or worked in, anything with a W is a war zone, or at least it was when I was there. So you got Croatia and Bosnia, Rwanda during the war, Sierra Leone during the war, all over Africa, Chechnya, uh, Latin America, Middle East, all of it. Since I've left the military, my job has been mainly working for humanitarian aid sector, so NGOs care. Uh, now I work for a group called uh, Act Alliance out of Geneva. So my day job when I'm not doing overland travel is trying to keep aid workers safe. For those of you know, any, anyone here ever work in the aid industry? Yes, I know you did. Uh, that's my wife, by the way, who's <laughs> probably been to almost all of these countries and more as well. Um, she was kidnapped by Hamas once. There you go. In uh, the occupied territories. Anyway, um, so the the real interesting parallel, and I think the reason Tom wanted me to talk here, was that aid workers go to the same places we like to go, deserts, jungles, mountains. They don't carry weapons. There's no soldiers protecting them. They don't have knives. They don't have you know, explosive devices wired to their vehicles, very little security equipment whatsoever. But they go to some of the most dangerous places on the planet. All through Somalia, even when there was no government, aid workers were working in Somalia, Afghanistan. Before the war in Afghanistan, they worked there under the Taliban. They worked through throughout the war, and they're still working there. So there are ways to travel and be safe in very dangerous environments uh, if you're smart about it. Uh, and I'm going to take you through a very, very short version of how I talk to NGOs about planning travel or work in sort of at-risk locations. Make sense? OK. So the first thing you have to do is understand risk. Um, a lot of people just get it in their head that, okay, Algeria, horribly dangerous place, Al-Qaeda kidnappings, you know, the, the Inaminas gas station or oil station attack, horrible place. But to write off an entire country because you hear some bad news is just not smart. I lived in Zimbabwe when everyone else thought I was mad. This would have been from about 2000 to 2005 when Robert Mugabe and the boys were systematically reducing the country to nothing chasing out all the white farmers, they were being murdered. Everyone thought, are you completely mad to live in Zimbabwe? In actual fact, at the time, despite what the media tells you, Zimbabwe was probably far safer than my home country of Canada. It's just the way the media works, they love to tell you negative stories. And we get bombarded with them so much every day that we think the whole world is in a state of chaos. But in actual fact, statistically, this is one of the most peaceful periods in the history of our planet. So just a couple of definitions. Um, just so we're clear on what we're talking about. So a threat 
is a safety or security hazard that exists in the environment you're traveling through. So something that's out there. You have no control over it. It's just part of the environment. That could be anything from Al-Qaeda to uh, heavy rains that cause flooding in the area you're in, wash out a bridge so you can't get to the place you need to go. It can be uh, health hazards, you know, like catching malaria or, you know, just breaking a leg and getting to a hospital and not having the right uh, equipment to treat you with. A lot of the people I know travel with their own syringes and needles because they don't trust the ones you'll find in clinics that you travel to. So they bring their own and they hand them to the doctor if they need an injection, antibiotics or anything. So risk though, is your degree of exposure to that threat. So there may be a threat in the environment. For instance, if you were going to be going to Morocco right now, there's a fair bit of underneath the sort of surface political unrest in Morocco. The king sort of staved off the Arab Spring revolts by sort of empowering parliament. There were new elections. There was a whole lot of sort of <clears throat> bribes, let's say they were called to the Moroccan people, and he sort of kept it tamped down. But there's a lot of sort of lingering unrest. Probably about once a month, the security forces are uh, finding an Al Qaeda or an Islamic State recruiting cell. Uh, the Moroccans and the Americans are very close buddies, so their intelligence services work quite well. But underneath the surface, there's always these things going on. So that is a threat in the environment. But are you at risk as a traveler, as an overlander going to visit Morocco or as a tourist? And that's what you have to be able to gauge. The threat exists, but are you going to be a target of it? So if you're going to do a trip to Norway, obviously violent crime isn't the issue, but probably weather could be. Um, we just did a trip to Morocco and one of the guys took a Vauxhall. And when he needed shock absorbers, Moroccan mechanics had probably didn't even know what a Vauxhall was. So he had to make a wild ass guess at what kind of springs fit. So in Norway, you probably, they might know what a Vauxhall is if that's what you drive. But you could probably also order parts. So you just have to start thinking about what your threat levels are. If you're going to go to Russia, you wanted to drive across Russia right now to Mongolia. Obviously, there's an increasing amount of tension between Europe and Russia at the moment, and you're going to have to ask yourself, at the border, are you going to have trouble? If you get pulled over by a Russian police uh, checkpoint somewhere on a road in the middle of nowhere, how are they going to react to you, knowing that Russian cops are corrupt at the best of times? So you've got to start thinking, what is my appetite for risk, and how much risk am I going to face? So some typical risks that you might face as an overlander, I've kind of broken them down into vehicle health and environment. So under vehicle, you get obviously the very most common vehicle accident. Um, just on that, with aid workers especially, they're obsessed with being kidnapped by Islamic State. They're just paranoid about kidnapping. It terrifies aid workers. But statistically, they're more likely to be eaten by a great white shark than they are to be kidnapped. And so I always tell them that the thing that's going to get most of us, either injure us or kill us, in the course of doing our work, is this. But because we do it every day, we become accustomed to the risk of it. And we don't really rate it very highly. Especially overlanders, because all we're thinking about is the great things we're going to see, not the local traffic conditions we've got to drive through. OK, so you've thought about your appetite for risk. How much am I willing to accept before this trip uh, should not proceed? Once you've thought about that, then you've got to think about the actual risks you're going to face, and which one of those you could probably manage, and how you're going to manage it. And the way I teach aid workers to do this, we use this little mathematical formula. We say risk equals probability plus impact. So probability is the likelihood that a threat is going to affect you. And impact, the damage that an incident from that threat would do. So something like a vehicle accident. Probability, actually quite high. Impact could also be quite high. You could die or be seriously injured, lose your vehicle. So if you're going to reduce the risk, you're going to have to figure out a way to reduce either the probability, the likelihood that something's going to happen, and we can sort of think about that as prevention, or you're going to have to figure out a way to reduce the impact, the damage it's going to do to you if it does occur anyway, so all your prevention strategies didn't work. So an example. Reduce the risk of a vehicle accident. So we know the area we're going, let's say you're going to Kenya. Some of the worst drivers I've ever experienced in the world around Nairobi. Probably out in the bush, maybe not as bad. I actually got off a plane, was handed a set of keys to a Toyota Corolla car, and told the Ni Nairobi rules for the road, which was only one. The front of your car is two inches in front of the other car, you have the right of way. And that's the only rule in driving in Nairobi. But anyway, so you want to reduce the probability the likelihood that a vehicle accident is going to occur. Some of the things you could do is well-maintained vehicle, uh, 
Safe speeds for the road and terrain. You know, it's not a Perry Dakar rally. You don't have to be doing it at 150 miles an hour. Wear your seat belts, which some people don't do once they get off the tar, and I know I'm guilty of that. Research your road conditions. What type of roads are you going to be on? Is it a lot of gravel? Is it a lot of sand? Is it the kind of thing that, you know, one centimeter of rain is going to turn to a, an ice skating rink? So if we're thinking about vehicle accidents, we're driving in not a good context. Here's what we can do sort of on the preventive side. But if everything we do to prevent it is not a success and we have an accident anyway, we can do some things to limit the impact. So have a good first aid kit and train on how to use it. I can't emphasize how much good first aid training uh, is worthwhile. Have good medic medical evacuation insurance. I don't know if anyone here when you travel, you get SOS or one of these uh, European big insurance covers. So if you get injured, they will actually, one, identify what doctors and hospitals you can get treated at, where there's a Western quality of uh, medical care. Uh, they'll also pay to have you flown out of that country, not to your home necessarily, but to where there is an approved medical center and they're sort of scattered around the world in various places. And then from that point, once you're sort of out of danger, then you can be returned home. So depending on where you're going, that kind of medical insurance is very important to have. So here we've, so we've considered that this is a threat. We've reduced the probability, so we've taken some preventative steps, but if it happens anyway, we've tried to reduce the impact. Make sense? So some really useful advice there. Now this was geared up for overlanding and long expeditions, but it could also apply to going green laning or organizing trips for your Land Rover Club. So uh, some great things to think about. As mentioned before, you can also check out our website and YouTube channel where we will have the whole raft of seminars there and that one in full also. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so do get in contact with us on Facebook and or Twitter or via our website. And until next time, we bid you farewell. Bear Mac Land Rover Parts are proud sponsors of Land Rovers Live bring you all the best parts of the 4x4 world.